Hello and welcome to Respiratory Quick Check Assessment. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing, made incredibly easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk a little bit about our respiratory quick check. First of all, starting out with this scenario here, Ms. Kelp is admitted to your floor with pneumonia and a history of COPD. 20 minutes after her admission, she develops worsening dyspnea and hypotension. What assessments? Are you going to use to assess her respiratory status? And how will you know if she gets progressively worse or progressively better? When you're thinking of a respiratory assessment, oftentimes we're thinking of that head-to-toe type of assessment of our patient. We may not have time for that right now. If she's starting to develop worsening dyspnea and hypotension, we may not have time to be able to get into a full, deep assessment. So what do we do? We need a quick check, first of all, to be able to find out, hey, is this a problem or not? And then secondly, to be able to monitor our patient so we can tell whether or not she's getting progressively better or progressively worse. There's two red flags to be looking for here in a patient who has a respiratory problem. Oftentimes, these are seen before you see any other symptoms of a respiratory problem. That is subjective dyspnea and an increase in respiratory rate. Now, that may sound very straightforward to you. You may say, well, geez, I know that, right? Subjective dyspnea. Subjective, it's coming from the patient. The patient's saying, I feel short of breath. You look at the patient, patient's respiratory rate is 20, 22, and you think, Psst, that's nothing, right? A lot of people have a respiratory rate of 20. Okay, but it's that subjective feeling. Patients will often feel that before there's any symptoms because they're starting to get some fluid building up in that interstitial space. So if that's the case, if that's what's happening, they're going to feel this subjective dyspnea way before there's any symptoms you see on the outside. And an increase in respiratory rate. Now, again, I'm not talking about the jump from, say, 18 to 40. Everybody can pick that up, right? What we're talking about here is we're talking about a little bit of an increase. It went from 20 to 22. It went from 20 to 24. And the patient's now complaining of subjective dyspnea. These are early warning signs, red flags, that there is something happening with your patient. And we better start paying attention. When we're assessing our patient for respiratory problems, we want to be looking at a number of different things. First of all, fluid volume status. What's the patient's overall fluid volume? That could give us a cue as to whether or not there might be some fluid building up in the lungs if the patient's overhydrated. On the other hand, we could probably, in many cases, we are probably not going to have a patient with pulmonary edema if the patient's dry. We want to listen to our lung sounds. If you're unfamiliar with lung sounds or want to review them, make sure you watch our video on assessing lung sounds. Look at the respiratory work. How much work is this patient doing in her breathing? Now, the patient in the picture in the background here, she has to sit up to breathe. She can't breathe laying down. She's sitting up. She's holding onto that mask. It's kind of her lifeline here right now, helping her to breathe. A lot of cues we're seeing in that picture that this patient is not feeling very well and is having that subjective dyspnea. Our PA2, FiO2 ratio. So what we do here is we take the patient's PO2 and we divide it by the FiO2 in not a fraction or not a percentage, but we put it into a decimal. So for example, 50% would be 0.5 as the FiO2. So if our PaO2 is 100 and our FiO2 is 50%, it would be 100 divided by 0.5. Okay, when you're dividing by a number smaller than 1, you end up with a number that's bigger than what you started from. So in other words, in that scenario, if the PaO2 is 100 and the FiO2 is 50%, so we're dividing 100 by 0.5, we'd end up with 200. Our PaO2 FiO2 ratio gives us a good clue as to what's happening with our gas exchange. How well is our oxygen able to make it across that alveolar capillary membrane and into the bloodstream? Oxygen saturation, 
as another possibility. In order for us to develop an oxygen saturation, the oxygen has to get across that alveolar capillary membrane, has to get into the bloodstream and dissolve as PO2 first, and then the PO2 will attach to hemoglobin and become oxygen saturation. The problem with, and we'll get to this in just a minute, some of our ways of monitoring oxygen saturation is that they don't always tell us what we think they will. And lastly, vital signs. Again, we're looking for that subtle change, those trends that are occurring in the vital signs. If you're not taking the vital signs in your patient, maybe a tech or an aide is doing that for you, we may have to make sure that we're getting that data. So as the nurse, you are responsible for getting that data from the tech so that you can assess it to be able to determine whether or not there's slight changes. We don't want it to happen that we get to the end of the shift and suddenly we see, oh wow, there was a slight change and a slight change and a slight change. And now, if we look at beginning to end of shift, there's a big change. We don't want to see that. We want to be seeing it as it is progressing. So what are some of the problems I hinted to here with pulse oximetry? One of the most common ways that we assess somebody's oxygenation is we pop a little pulse oximeter on them. Keep in mind that a pulse oximeter is per per peripheral, Okay, so it's looking at our peripheral circulation, in this case here, the fingertips. Sometimes we use the earlobe, the forehead, etc. It uses a light source, and it uses red light, which has a very low wavelength, which means that any other light in the room is going to interfere with it. If you're having trouble getting a pulse ox on someone, put the sheets over, put the little thing on their finger, put the sheets over their finger so it's in the dark, and you'll oftentimes be able to pick up a pulse ox where you weren't able to before. It indirectly measures oxygen bound to hemoglobin, so it's not directly pulling blood out of the patient and analyzing the hemoglobin, so it's doing an indirect measurement. And because of that, it can often be inaccurate. Pay attention to what your patient looks like more than what the oxygen saturation looks like. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is the changes in pulse oximetry or changes in our oxygen saturation are a late sign and change after the patient's decompensating. So for pulse ox to go down, the patient has to already decompensate. When you're doing your assessment on your patient and you're listening to the breath sounds, focus on the back, specifically in the bases in the back. This is the area of the lung, number one, that has the best perfusion, so we're going to have as much oxygenation and gas transport as possible there. And it's also the area of the lung where fluid will accumulate first because in most of our patients, they're laying in a hospital bed, which means they're supine with the head of the bed elevated. So where is gravity going to take that fluid? It's going to take it to the bases in the back. So focus your assessment on the bases in the back and then work up. If you need a quick assessment on your patient, so you only have a second or two to do a quick assessment on your patient. Listen to the bases in the back. That's where the trouble starts first. Well, thank you for joining me for a respiratory quick check assessment. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.